This is an introduction to the Wimparis bomb site, also known as the course setting bomb site, developed by Harry Wimparis. He began developing bomb sites as early as 1916 to solve problems that had been encountered during World War I with bomb sites who were unable to account for drift. Since man began traveling the waters and flying through the air, he has known about the effects of wind on the direction taken. When dealing with a wind that is not coming from directly ahead or behind, the aircraft must angle into that wind to continue on a straight line to the destination. Otherwise, the aircraft will be pushed further and further downwind. For pilots, this is known as crabbing into the wind, but a more precise term is establishing the drift angle. An aircraft flying directly into the wind is facing a headwind, and when flying directly away from the wind is experiencing a tailwind. All other winds will have a crosswind component. The wind vector, therefore, consists of a headwind or tailwind component vector and a crosswind component vector. The drift angle is determined to count the effects of the crosswind vector. These winds not only affect the heading and path of the aircraft, but they affect bombs released from the aircraft. Early methods of dropping bombs in World War I could not solve for the drift problem. Bomb runs had to take place by flying either directly into the wind or away from it. Since the enemy knew the wind direction as well, it eliminated some of the element of surprise as they knew from which direction the attack would come and could position their defenses accordingly. Harry Wimparis recognized this problem and devised a series of bomb sites to help solve the drift problem. These were called the course setting bomb site or Wimparis bomb site. Because these sites could calculate the necessary solutions and vectors, they belong to the class of bomb sites known as vector bomb sites. This is an E6B computer, and if you are a pilot, you will recognize this instantly. If not, here is an example of how the wind's effect on heading and ground speed can be determined. First, you turn the wheel to the bearing of the wind direction. In this case, we'll say 40 degrees. Now you place a dot on a line representing the aircraft's true airspeed. In this case, we'll say 20 knots. Then you turn the wheel to the aircraft's heading. And in this example, we'll go with true north. Finally, you set the dot on a line representing the aircraft's true airspeed. In this case, we'll say 160 knots. You now learn two things. The first is that the drift angle will be five degrees to the right, and the new ground speed will be 144 knots. This is a simple illustration of how the drift problem can be solved and introduces us to the Mark 9 course setting bomb site. The bomb site incorporated this computing function into a large number of gears that would allow the site to be set up and solve the vector problem. This is a Mark 9 bomb site developed prior to and used during World War II. There were two major types, the Type A and the Type C. The Type A was for smaller bombers and its speed was measured in miles per hour and it could be used at ground speeds from 50 to 300 miles an hour. This is a Type C and it was graduated in knots and it could be used at ground speeds from 50 to 260 knots and this was for larger bombers with longer range. Both could be used from 3,000 to 20,000 feet. The Mark 9 had some newer features over earlier models including this auxiliary drift wire which made finding the drift angle easier. And this fourth vector component which allowed for bombing moving targets such as ships at sea. The first order of business when using the course setting bomb site is to determine the wind direction and drift angle. There are three major ways to do this and I will demonstrate one of them. The first step is to adjust it for the true air speed. In this case, 180 knots. We then will set the wind speed to maximum.
We'll set the height above ground level on the red scale here and we'll set this to 14,000 feet. Next, we need to determine the drift angle. We have a wind coming from this direction and the airplane is therefore angled into the wind to correct for that. However, that is not the path of the aircraft over the ground. The path of the aircraft over the ground is in this direction. Objects will therefore pass along this direction and we can use the auxiliary drift bar to help determine what that drift angle is. We adjust this until we see objects on the ground passing underneath this wire here on the auxiliary drift bar. This tells us that our drift angle is minus 10 degrees. We then are going to use the compass clutch milled head to set that same drift angle on the bomb site, which is minus 10 degrees here. Now we need to determine what the wind speed is, and we're going to do that using these timing beads. As objects pass underneath, we will start a stopwatch when it passes under this speed and stop it when it passes under this speed. In this case, for our example, we'll say this was 20 seconds. Now we're going to unlock the bearing plate, and we're going to rotate it to what's called red over red. The front part of this compass needle is red, and we're going to rotate this until it's directly over the front part of the compass needle, which is down here. We now have red over red. We're then going to use this wind gauge cursor, and we're going to adjust this so that the airspeed of 180 knots interacts with the time in seconds that we obtain from our stopwatch, which is 20 seconds. We're then going to use a chinograph pencil, which comes out of its special holder here next to its pencil sharpener, and we're going to draw a mark on the glass through the hole in the wind speed cursor. We're then going to unlock the bearing plate, and we're going to rotate the bearing plate until that mark is over the tail of the wind arrow. And here's the mark over the tail of the wind arrow. We relock the bearing plate and we're going to turn the compass bowl using our uh, compass clutch milled head until the wind arrow is perpendicular to the bomb site. It doesn't matter which direction you turn it because what we're going to do is adjust this to obtain our wind speed and it doesn't matter whether we're coming from this direction or this direction. Now that the wind arrow is perpendicular to the bomb site, we will adjust the wind speed until that hole is now back over the mark. We'll set the terminal velocity of the bomb and as we can see from this scale here the terminal velocity is 2700 and we'll set that on the terminal velocity adjustment here. We will now track towards the target so that the target and objects are coming down along the drift wires and we will continually adjust the compass clutch mill knob to keep red on red. The bomb site is now set up. As the airplane travels to the left and right, the bombardier will continually adjust to keep red on red, back and forth as the airplane turns. The bombardier will now be looking from the back site to the foresight. The target will travel down the drift wires, and when the target and the foresight and the back side are aligned, the bombs are released. To bomb a moving target, 
the estimated target direction and wind speed are entered here. And this puts in the estimated target speed and this puts in the estimated target direction. The bomb run is continued as before and again when the moving target is sighted from the back sight to the fore sight the bombs are released. This bomb sight worked very well for the RAF but clearly there were limitations and more accuracy was needed. It eventually evolved into both the stabilized automatic bombing system which was gyroscopically stable but a more direct descendant was the Mark 14 bomb site, also known as the American T1 bomb site.